Shalom, Shalom, Yasharala. First things first, I want to give all praise, honor, and glory to the Most High Power, Yahweh, in the name of His Son, Yahweh Shai. And I want to send love and blessings and peace to all the sincere brothers and sisters out there in the four corners of the earth. This is going to be a short video. I hope it's edifying. The topic is archaeological evidence of the existence of the children of Israel. Now, by no means should any of this have anything to do with your faith. Okay. Because our belief and trust on Yahweh is based on faith, not on proof. Okay. Paul said what? Faith is the hope for things unseen. So whether I was showing you this or not, it should already be in your spirit to believe and have faith that not only are you God's chosen people, but that he loves you. And he's dealing with you in your daily lives if you're doing your best in earnest to keep his law, statutes, and commandments. Okay? But this is just for education, um, just for information. You got a lot of gainsayers that want to say, you know, where's the proof? Where's the proof? Uh, you know, Egypt is written on the walls. We got our proof. But see, most of the people saying that is Israelites anyway. They just don't know who they are. They've lost their heritage. And that's why the scriptures say this. The book of Isaiah, chapter 30, verse 3. Therefore, shall the strength of Pharaoh be your shame and the trust in the shadow of Egypt, your confusion. And what do we see out there in the world? A bunch of confused brothers and sisters that don't know their heritage or their history. They looking all over trying to find the truth when it's right in front of them the whole time. All they had to do is open up the book of the law and read. That's it. The scriptures say the law is perfect, converting the soul, but brothers never want to give it a chance. They want to try everything but the real truth, which is that you are Israelite and that your heritage and your way of life, your culture is the law, statutes and commandments. That's what's going to heal our nation. So hopefully, you know, this video just shines a little bit of light on the history and just strengthens you brothers and sisters in the spirit. Okay, without any further ado, uh, let's begin. All right. Our first artifact is going to be the Moabite stone, otherwise known as the Misha steel or the Misha stele. Okay. A stele is a vertical slab. You know, it's like a, uh, a vertical, a small monolith that they used in the past to record certain uh, important events. Or certain uh, historical moments within a nation's um, history, you know, whether they won a war, uh, whether they conquered somebody, whether they lost or there's a famine or a drought and they would commemorate it um, with a stele or a steel. OK, so this is the uh, Moabite stone or the Misha stele. All right. It's in the Louvre Museum in Paris. It's from 840 BCE. So essentially, this is. 2,856 years old. If I'm not mistaken, if my calculations are correct. Okay, so why is this object special? Why does it matter? Because it mentions Israel. It mentions the house of David. And it also mentions the proper name of the Most High. All right, let's bring it out. Okay, so on line one of the Moabite stone, it says this. It says, I am Mesha, son of Chemosh Gad, king of Moab, the Dibonite. My father reigned over Moab 30 years, and I have reigned after my father. Okay, now, how does this link up with the scriptures? All right, let's turn to 2 Kings 3 and 4. Second Kings three and four, and it reads, and Mesha, king of Moab, was a sheep master and rendered unto the king of Israel a hundred thousand lambs and a hundred thousand rams with the wool. But it came to pass when Ahab was dead that the king of Moab rebelled against the king of Israel. All right. So now what's, what's what do we see here? We see that. The Moabite stone names their king as Mesha. We see that the Bible in 2 Kings 3 and 4 recognizes King Mesha as the king of Moab. All right. So the Bible 
and the Moabite stone are linking up right now. Okay, so for the gainsayers that say, oh, man, that history's not real. Where's the artifacts? Where's the proof? Well, here's another nation's artifact linking up with the Bible, totally unrelated. So as far as comparative research goes, this is a primary source to back up the existence of the the reign of King Jehoram because Jehoram was king. He was the son of Ahab. He was the king during the time of uh, the Moabite stone being created. OK. And what does he say? He says Masha was the king of Moab and he was a sheep master. What does the Moabite stone say? It says, I am Masha, son of Chemosh Gad, the king of Moab. All right. So there's your first link up. OK, so next up on the Moabite stone, line five, it reads Amri was king of Israel. Ha, see, you can't get around that. The Moabite stone actually mentions Israel. Reading on, it says, and oppressed Moab during many days. And Chemosh was angry with his aggressions. His son succeeded him. And he also said, I will oppress Moab. In my days, he said, let us go and I will see my desire upon him and his house. And Israel said, I shall destroy it forever. This is on line five of the Moabite stone. OK, so what you're seeing here is another nation mentioning how the Israelites were their enemies. And it says Israel twice. OK. So there you go again. Another hardcore can't get around it artifact mentioning Israel. OK. Now, how does that link up with the scriptures? Uh, let's turn to Second Kings three and five. Let's go back there. I read that earlier. Let's go back over it and let's see how Moabite stone line five links up with Second Kings three and five. OK. Most high is amazing. You see how that worked out? Watch this. Second Kings three and five. OK, but it came to pass when Ahab was dead, that the king of Moab rebelled against the king of Israel. OK, going back to the Moabite stone, we see how that links up. The king of Moab rebelled against the king of Israel. And what does it say? It says Omri was king of Israel and oppressed Moab during many days and Chemosh was angry with his aggressions. How was he angry with his aggressions? He rebelled. OK, so there you go. The Moabite stone again is reading synonymous almost line for line with the Holy Bible. OK, there's no getting around that. All right. And I got uh, one more thing to show you from this artifact. Actually, a couple more things. OK. Um, before we move on to the next one. All right. This one. This one has a lot of info on it. And I mean, just right here alone, you got to acknowledge the children of Israel because the Moabite stone right here. OK. Is verifying not only the aggression between the Moabites, enemies of Israel, but they're verifying each other in the same time period. OK. That's convergent history and comparative research. All right. Let's go to line 18 of the Moabite stone. Look what it says here. It says, and I took from it the vessels of Yahweh. yes the Moabite stone uses the proper name of the most high God and acknowledges him as the God of Israel okay because you see here they're gloating for taking some of the vessels okay from uh you know our temples all right so we see here that the Moabites and the Israelites were enemies okay the Bible tells you the Moabites were the enemies of the Israelites and here um, uh, a Moabite artifact is telling you that the Moabites and the Israelites were enemies. All right, let's let's move on to one more. I found uh, an, another line that links up with the Bible, and I just want to bring that out really quick. It's Moabite stone line twenty five and twenty six, and it says, "Make you every man a well in his house." And I dug the ditch for Kacha with the chosen men of Israel. All right. Now, what does that really mean? Well, that's saying that um, they took prisoners of some of the Israelite warriors and made them dig water ditches. OK, 
Because when you used to fight wars in ancient times, you'd be out in a big field or in a clearing and you'd set up camp. And, you know, one of the essential things was water. OK, so they would dig ditches to collect rainwater or to channel water. OK, into one place so the men could drink. And of course, if you took prisoners, you're going to make them dig the ditches. OK, so here you see the Moabite stone is marking that moment. All right. But now let's see what the Bible says. Turn to Second Kings three and 16. OK. Second Kings three and 16. And see how this links up, because this event is marked in the Bible. OK. Now, the Moabites are telling it from a victorious standpoint, but the scriptures say we won that battle. But let's just see. Let's see what's there. Second uh, Kings three and 16. Uh, Salaki, I got first king. Second Kings three and 16. OK, and it reads and he said, thus saith Yahweh, make this valley full of ditches. For thus saith the Lord, ye shall not see wind, neither shall ye see rain. Yet that valley shall be filled with water that ye may drink, both ye and your cattle and your beasts. Verse 18. And this is but a light thing in the sight of Yahweh. He will deliver the Moabites also into your hand. OK. So on the Moabite stone, they tried to tell it from the standpoint that they dug those ditches. But we see here the Bible is saying that actually the, the Israelites, we dug the ditches by the command of the most high. And he said, it's not going to rain. You're not going to see anything like that. I'm going to fill those ditches with water so that you could drink. But see, on the Moabite stone, they tried to uh, make it as if they dug those ditches and that they forced the Israelites to do it. But see, the point here it doesn't matter uh, who who did it or not. You know, I, I have faith in the scriptures and in your house. So I know that we did as he commanded because uh, as it goes on into verse 24 we see that we smote the Moabites in that land even into their country all right we stomped them out like we supposed to do okay but um the Moabite stone is backing up a biblical story they're just trying to tell it from their point of view but you can't get around the fact that they're telling you it happened okay so not only do they verify the children of Israel existing they verify fighting with the children of Israel and they even mention the God of the children of Israel. So here's your archaeological evidence right here. OK, this should, everybody should know about this one. But see what happens is you have people that say, OK, this has been plagiarized. You can't trust the Moabite stone. We need another source. OK, you want to gain say I got another source. OK, next up, we have the prisms of Sennacherib. All right. Who's Sennacherib? Sennacherib was the king of Assyria, another enemy of the kingdom of Israel. And he was um, around during the reign of King Hezekiah. King Hezekiah was one of the, uh, you know, the righteous kings of Israel after Solomon. He was one of the righteous kings. OK, um, the Sennacherib prisms are from 689 B.C. That's 2705 years ago. OK. Ancient artifact, ancient artifact. Everybody knows who King Sennacherib is. He was a real person in history. And, you know, there's lots of archaeology that point to him. All right. The Sennacherib prisms are in three places because it's three of these things. All right. And then three places. One is in the British Museum. One is in the Oriental Institute of Chicago. And one is in the, uh, the, Isra the Israel Museum, Museum of Israel. All right. Why is this important? Because it mentions Judah. And it also mentions King Hezekiah. OK. All right. Let's see how. Let's see how. All right. On the Sennacherib prism, you're going to find a, a, a big block of text that mentions all these things in basically one large paragraph. Um, I've compiled it here and let's see what it says. All right. This is off of the Sennacherib's prism. OK. It says, as for the king of Judah. Hezekiah, who had not submitted to my yoke, I besieged and captured 46 of his fortified cities. All right. So we're looking at artifacts from enemies of Israel bragging about 
their exploits and fighting with us. Okay. I, for somebody to say the Israelites never existed, you're ignoring these things. You got to be ignoring these things. All right. You just choosing to be ignorant. All right. You want to, you want to be wise to eat, do evil, but to do good, you have no knowledge. You're just ignoring this. All right. Let's read it again. It says, as for the king of Judah, Hezekiah, who had not submitted to my yoke, I besieged and captured 46 of his fortified cities. Well, let's read the Bible and see if that account is in the Bible. OK, let's see. Turn to Isaiah chapter 36 and uh, verse one. OK, Isaiah 36 and one. Let's see what it says here. It says, now it came to pass in the 14th year of King Hezekiah that Sennacherib, the king of Assyria, came up against all the defensed cities of Judah and took them. OK, so the Bible is admitting that Sennacherib captured some of their cities. Right. And Sennacherib is it made a monument to himself because he was proud of himself because that's an achievement. All right. Israel's we, we we're one of the, the greatest fighting nations in history. All right. Because we had the most high behind us. You get straight stomped out. But, you know, we went off and we lost some of that protection. And as as we know today, our kingdom fell. All right. So these nations are gloating about it. What is he saying? He's saying he took 46 cities. All right. What does the Bible say? It says Sennacherib came up and he took cities you know he took all he came up against all the defense cities of judah and took them all right it's admitted all right and you can link that up with second kings 8 and 13 it basically says the same exact thing all right because isaiah was the prophet during that time okay so here we have it again okay convergent history here's another artifact backing up the existence of the children of israel okay even the name of the king at the time all right. And the Bible says the same thing verbatim, basically. So doubt in these scriptures, but you want to believe archaeological finds. Well, if you believe archaeological finds, you got to believe these scriptures because they say the same thing. All right. You're getting less and less place to run around. All right. The Bible is the one true book. It's a book of history laws. OK, history and laws. All right. All that game saying has got to stop. OK, back to this prison. All right. Reading down a little bit. It says what? It says I shut him up talking about Hezekiah like a caged bird in his royal city of Jerusalem. I then constructed a series of fortresses around him and did not allow anyone to come out of the city gates. All right. So what do we have here? All right. We know the Bible says that one hundred eighty five thousand of Sennacherib's men died. OK overnight they just was dead the angel of the lord came and put them all to death all right sennacherib don't mention that why would he all right but you know what he does admit he admit that hezekiah was fenced into his stronghold and he couldn't really get inside all right the bible says the same exact thing and the bible also tells you how sennacherib died all right but that's a story for another day but what you see here is sennacherib's records written in stone reading the same as the bible okay he said he took some cities the bible said he came and took some cities he said he, he didn't really get inside he stayed on the outside the bible said he stayed on the outside uh but see the bible goes on to give you more vivid and tell you that 185,000 of his men was put to death overnight all right one of the great stories uh in the history of the children of israel sennacherib he kind of left that out all right the bible also tells you how sennacherib dies so if you want to know all that you know, open up the Bible and read the scriptures. You know, the answers are inside. Simple as that. Let's move on to the next artifact. Yes, there's more. All right. Next up, we got the Merneptah Stele. Merneptah Stele. I think I'm saying that correct. Um, this is from 1208 BC. That means this is 3,224 years old. All right. Ancient. It's a granite slab commemorating a victory 
All right, that's what pretty much all these items are. When when a, when a nation does something great, they want to commemorate it. Where can you find this? This is in the Egyptian Museum in Cairo. Why is it important? Because this is the first recorded mention of Israel in all archaeological records. All right, the first time you see Israel mentioned. Okay. Let's uh, let's have a look at it. All right. It says uh. Merneptah Stele, line 27. It says, conquered is Ascalon, captured is Gezer. Yenoam tears are finished. Existing is Israel, the people. Devastated with no seeds is Karu. All right. So there you have it. 3,224 years ago, an Egyptian king made mention of the children of Israel. And we know the Bible tells you that Joseph was over there and he was a great man in that kingdom. And that's where we waxed mighty. You know, we've multiplied exceedingly until, you know, we left with Moses. All right. So here's an Egyptian artifact mentioning the children of Israel, the Merneptah Stele. All right. I'm going to read it again. Conquered is Ascalon, captured is Gezer, Yenoam's tears are finished. Existing is Israel, the people. Devastated with no seeds is Karu. All right. So there you go. Karu is a Hittite nation. And um, there's a lot of records about there being a big um, famine or a big drought that uh, destroyed some of those nations. Um, and Menepta, he dispatched cereal. Or like grains to the people that were starving in those lands, victim of that famine. Uh, devastated with no seeds is Karu, meaning they had no crops. They was devastated by the famine. And, you know, Merneptah's Stele marks that moment that Egypt sent. And that's in other archaeological evidence. I don't have it on me, but, you know, I let an Egyptologist prove that. That Egypt did something good. They sent cereals or grains to this other Canaanite nation. This, this These other... Hamitic nations, okay, uh, Kati and Karu, but you see here it tells you that the children of Israel are existing, and why would they make mention of that? Because we left, and they came back into contact with us. Like, yo, the Israelites is out there doing their thing, man. The Most High is still blessing those people, man. You know, so there you go. The Merneptah Stele, the first recorded mention of the children of Israel in the archaeological record, three thousand two hundred and twenty-four years old. Are, are the Egyptologists telling you about this? All right. <laughs> I don't think so. Um, let's move on. I got a couple more for y'all before we get out of here. All right. A couple more for y'all. Okay. Next up, we got the Tel Dan Stele. The Tel Dan Stele. All right. It's a broken piece of basalt. Speaking of a victory over the Israelites, okay? How old is this thing, right? Tell Dan Stele, it's from 870 to 750 BCE, right? It's like rounded off. Let's choose the earliest time. Um, 750 BCE. Let's, let's for, for, the, for argument's sake, let's not make it older. Let's choose the younger time, right? It's still 2,766 years old. Ancient. Right. Where can this be found in the Israel Museum? And why is it important? It speaks of the king of Israel and the house of David. All right. Another one. All right. Let's look at the Tel Dan Stele. Um, let's break it down. OK. On the, on lines number seven of the Tel Dan Stele of the words that could be recovered, you see riots and thousands of horsemen. I killed Joram, Ram son of of Ahab all right how does that link up with the Bible how, how does well Ahab was a wicked Israelite king all right you might remember his uh his wife was uh Jezebel was Ahab's wife all right and his son's name was Joram okay uh let's find out that account let's turn to second Kings 828 second Kings 828 and let's see if this links up 
second king eight twenty eight. And what does it say? It says, and he went with Joram, the son of Ahab to the war against Hazael, king of Syria and Ramoth Gilead and the Syrians wounded Joram. OK. OK. Now, the Bible says that Joram didn't die. But if you think about it now, he, he had to retreat. It says, and the king Joram went back to be healed in Jezreel of the wounds which the Syrians had given him at Ramah when he fought against Hazael, king of Syria. All right. So what happened there? You it, imagine the battle. You wounded the guy. He's an important man in the army. He's the king's son. Right. You wounded him. He fled. He retreated. OK, you're going to come back and you're going to tell all your people, yo, we killed the king's son. They took his body back. We've seen it. Right. So let's read it again. Riots and thousands of horsemen. Speaking of the, the skirmish, I killed Joram, son of Ahab. OK, and 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 who who are we talking about right now? We're talking about the Teledan Stele. Uh, Salaki, I didn't mention it before, but this is made for a man called Hazael of Aram Damascus. OK, and what did you see in Second Kings 828? Ahab, uh, Salaki, Joram, the son of Ahab, went to war against Hazael, the king of Syria in Ramoth Gilead. OK, so we're talking about the same person here. I mean, you can't get around that. Let's let's read on. Um, line number eight, it says king of Israel. And I killed a Haziyahu son of Jehoramkin. OK. Then some of the pieces are broken. King of the house of David. And I set their towns into ruins and turned their land into desolation. So a stele is obviously a monument to a victory in a war. Hazael is telling it from his side, saying that he won, saying that he killed some of the people in Israel, some of the mighty men. Let's see what the Bible says. Second Kings nine and 28. I read some of it earlier, but let's bring back the emphasis. If you look at the latter part, it says, and Ahaziah, the son of Jehoram, king of Judah, went down to see Joram, the son of Ahab in Jezreel, because he was sick. See, now the Bible doesn't mention Ahaz Ahaziah being killed. But what is the Teledan Stele? It mentions his name. It says, and I killed Ahaziah who? So they pronounced it differently. Son of Jehoram, kin. You know, they, they spoke a different language. So names don't translate the same right names don't translate the same you want to say names in their original language to get them right <laughs> just uh israel know what i'm talking about you all right you know we like to say the name of the lord in hebrew you know out of respect and and reverence and, and being earnest all right but that's that's the story for another day um but yeah man you see it right here okay um the Teledan Stele is making mention of all these Israelite kings. It's saying they killed them. The Bible doesn't back that up. I, like I said, I roll with the scriptures. Okay. None of these shall fail. I roll with the scriptures. But here's another nation mentioning the children of Israel by name. They're kings. Okay. So you can't gainsay and say, no, all oh, them kings never existed. That never happened. Look, here, here's another nation 2,766 years ago telling you it happened all right from their side of the story so be it all right you still can't deny the history and i got another one let's keep it moving all right um next up we have the kirk monoliths the kirk monoliths all right these are the monol it's a monolith stele of Shalmaneser the third and Ashur Nasir Paul the second. All right, Th those names are, you know, those those uh those names are kind of hard to pronounce. Shalmaneser kind of rolls off the tongue, but Ash Ashur Nasir Paul the second. 
All right. It's in the British Museum. It mentions Ahab. OK, another another mention of Ahab, the king of Israel. All right. Um, it is from 879 B.C. That is exactly 2895 years ago. All right, y'all ancient. OK. Why is this special? Um, let's see what it says. OK, the Kirk monoliths. The fifth sentence, it says 700 chariots, 700 cavalry, and 10,000 or 20,000 soldiers belonging to Erhulini Ir of Hama. 2,000 chariots and 10,000 soldiers belonging to Ahab, the Israelite. Okay. So now what do we see here? We, we don't have a biblical account that mentions Ahab giving away 10,000 soldiers and 2,000 chariots. But we do know that Ahab was in uh, like he was in cahoots with Damascus, right? And he and and after the battle of Aphek in alliance with Ben-Hadad against their hereditary enemy Assyria. Okay? So, you know, he made alliances with other nations to to make them allies. He paid them tribute. So, it's not too far out of the realm that he was also paying tribute to Shalmaneser the third. Okay. That's, that's not too far out of the realm. So no, we do not have a scripture that backs this up, but since the gain says don't believe in the scriptures anyway, we got the artifact itself mentioning Ahab and the Israelites. All right. 10,000 soldiers belonging to Ahab, the Israelite. Okay. How old is this thing? 2,895 years old. So, you know, Ahab was wicked anyway. So all of his back dealings that he probably did it off the books and they wasn't recorded anyway. But guess what? This other nation, they backed it up. They mentioned it. They're saying that Ahab existed. They're saying that he was an Israelite. Three thousand years ago, y'all, basically three thousand years ago. All right. About 100 years, twenty nine hundred years ago. OK. So stop the game saying, all right, the artifacts are out there. All right. Y'all just wasn't looking hard enough because, hey, that's and, and that's why the most high he raises up his men to, to do this scholarship and do this work and take pleasure in it to to bring glory to his name. OK. All right. We almost done. Y'all we almost done. I got a couple more and and then and then we out of here. OK. The next one I have is the Nimrud tablet. The Nimrud tablet. OK. This is the first archaeological mention of the name Judah anywhere. OK, this is from 733 B.C. That makes it. Two thousand seven hundred and forty nine years old. OK, it's a tablet describing the first 17 years of Til of Tiglath Pileser the third's reign. OK, this can be found in the British Museum. All right. Remember that name Tiglath Pileser the third. OK, let's let's see what this says. See, this this thing was damaged badly, you know, as our most ancient artifacts. But there's a huge paragraph naming different kings in different cities. OK, of where Nimrud or I'm sorry, where uh, Tiglath, he was receiving tributes. OK, so in the past kings would honor themselves like okay all these nations paying me tribute and the bible tells you that it, the bible tells you all the nations who paid king solomon tribute okay it says they was bringing bringing him gold on boats and 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 concubines and all types of linen and 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 and, and, and uh incense and everything all types of tribute anybody who came to see him okay so that's 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 a kingly decree. You know, you got to bring a tribute when you come into his land. So this man has a tablet set up that's talking about all the different tributes he received. But see, look, looking on there, let's see what it says. It says. Jehovah, Jehovah has of the land of Judah. OK, it names a king Quas Malacca of the land of Edom. OK, now you see it's, uh, it's really badly damaged. You couldn't really make it out. But what does it say? It says gold, silver, tin, iron, lead, multicolored garments, linen garments, the garments of the land, red, purple, wool, all kinds of costly articles, 
produce of the sea and dry land, commodities of their lands, royal treasures, horses and mules broken to the yoke. These are all the types of things that you when you pay tribute, you would give to the king because he could use that in his kingdom. All right. Some of it was just for the king. Other things was for his kingdom. All right. So that's what this tablet is. It's marking the tributes. And what does it say? It says Jehoah has of the land of Judah paid him tribute also. And it mentions gold and silver. Well, let's see what that links up with the Bible. Turn to Second Kings 16. Okay. Second Kings chapter 16. Verses 7 and 8. Now, this tablet says King Jehoah has. But now remember, remember, remember. That's English. Jehoah has. There's no Yah E. There's uh Salaki. There's no J or E. All right. So it would have been Ahaz. Okay. Um, but they put the Je Jeho in front. Why? Because they knew the God of the children of Israel. It's Yahweh. All right. So in English, they transliterate it to Jehoah has, but it's really Yahweh has if they was trying to say it properly to the best of their ability. So it would be a has, but we, we call him Yahweh has because they named him by the God he served or the, the God of his people. OK. All right. That's deep right there. So now look, second Kings 16 and seven. What does it say? It says, so a has sent messengers to who tiglath pileser king of assyria saying i am thy servant and thy son come up and save me out of the hand of the king of syria and out of the hand of the king of israel which rise up against me so this is during the time where the kingdom was split and the king of israel and the king of judah would war against each other all right the northern and southern kingdom would have uh you know like a cold war against each other okay so what did Ahaz do? He was reaching out to Tiglath Pileser to, to give him some, some military strength in fighting with the king of Israel. Uh, reading on, what does it say? In verse 8, it says, And Ahaz took the silver and gold that was found in the house of the Most High and in the treasures of the king house and sent it for a present to the king of Assyria. Talking about Tiglath Pileser the third. And that was wicked to do. Why would you give um, the honorable things of God to another nation's king? But that's what we was dealing with at that time when the kingdom was split and we was going through all those issues. But the, as you see on the Nimrod tablet, it says Jehoah has of the land of Judah. Uh, Quasmalak of the land of Edom. And what is it going to say? Gold and silver. What does the Bible say? He sent silver and gold. All right. Come on, y'all. Don't be simple. That's the same account. All right. So now you have this ancient artifact backing up a biblical event 2,749 years ago. OK, the Bible and this artifact is on point with each other, y'all. So when people asking for artifacts, for proof, we need some type of proof. Uh, where's the where's the walls? We don't see no statues, nothing like that. Yo, you got to understand. The history of the Bible has been recorded through antiquity because the most high made it like that in the Holy Scriptures. All right. He had the other nations preserve our records so we could have them today. Why? Because in their pride, they was deceived. OK, they thought this book was about them. Then they learned it wasn't about them. Then they tried to use this book against us because our salvation is in this book. But also the history is in here. All right. The Bible got everything in here. That's why I believe this book. And now you're seeing that there's archaeology out there that's backing up everything this book says. OK. And it should be the other way around. The Bible's verifying what happened in history because, you know, history is tainted. OK, this is our story. This is our heritage. All right. Come back to your nationality. Come back to like open your mind up to this truth. This is the best thing you're going to read. It's nothing but wisdom in here and truth in this book. OK, so the game says got nothing else to say. All right. Unless they want to say what? Well, where's our, all these artifacts is from other nations talking about your people. All right. Where's your artifacts? Well, I'm going to hit you with something. If you turn to Jeremiah chapter eight, verse one, one of the punishments from the most high was to take our artifacts from us. It was to take our, you know, the, the, the graves of our kings from us. All right. Because we went off. 
you know, we got punished for that. We got humiliated for that. And one of our humiliations was the graves of our forefathers was desecrated. Okay. Sort of like what Esau does to the, the kings of uh, Egypt. Goes and robs their graves and puts them up in a museum. Okay. That's not glory. You can't glory in that. That's desecration. All right. Let's read that. Jeremiah 8 and 1. And it says. At that time, saith Yahweh, they shall bring out the bones of the king of Judah and the bones of his princes and the bones of the priests and the bones of the prophets and the bones of the inhabitants of Jerusalem out of their graves. And they shall spread them before the sun and the moon and all the host of heaven whom they have loved, whom they have served after whom they have walked and whom they have sought and whom they have worshipped. They shall not be gathered nor buried. They shall be for dung upon the face of the earth. All right. So that was one of our punishments, you know, losing our ancient burial sites. And that all goes and ties together with losing our heritage. Remember, this is the only captivity where we don't know who we are. So it's important to come back to our culture. What do you mean you're not dealing with the Hebrew? That's part of your culture. That's part of your understanding of these scriptures. You got to go back to the original words and get the sense, you know. So there's no there, there's no salvation in any other y'all. We got to come back to the truth of this Bible. You blacks, you Native Americans, and Hispanics, you got to come back to the beginning of your greatness, and it's found in the Holy Scriptures. Get you a King James sixteen eleven Bible with the Apocrypha, and you search the Scriptures, and you find the truth, and it's in there. Okay, the truth is in there. All right, so it's gonna be hard for it. it it's really no artifacts. On our side of this thing Because the most I scattered them for dung Upon the face of the earth But I got a little surprise for y'all One last thing We got the seal of Hezekiah Like I said It's only right Hezekiah was one of the righteous kings After Solomon You know And recently they unearthed A seal you know Like when they would send a letter They would take wax And melt it and then this, the king would have a signet ring. So this is how you know that it really came from the king because he had a personal ring and he would press his ring into the wax to leave an imprint. All right. A signet ring to leave his sign. So what did they find? Uh, so, so like, what did they find? They found the seal of Hezekiah. All right. It's in the Israel Museum. And this is an actual Israelite artifact. All right. It's from 727 B.C. That makes it 2,743 years old. That's amazing. What does it say? It says, belonging to Hezekiah, son of Ahaz, king of Judah. All right. It's a minuscule centimeter long artifact, and it's it's decorated with uh, a winged sun disc and an ox symbol. Now, oh. Oh, that's, e that's Egypt, son. That's Egypt, son. No, 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 no. You got to understand. The kings of Israel were well known in the land. Okay. It says that King Solomon had uh, Egyptian kings offer him treasure cities. Okay. And daughters. Okay. So this is obviously an artifact from Hezekiah to Egypt. Okay. He just put his seal on it. And that was proof that it was from the king to the king of Egypt, right? All right, so don't try to gainsay. All right, don't get simple. All right, that's that. That was done all through the history. Okay, so this is a true to life Israelite artifact, the seal of Hezekiah. Okay, all right, that's it, y'all. You know, um, you know, I don't really have much else except for you know just. To tell you, you know, just come back to your nationality. Come back to this truth, y'all. All right. Study the scriptures. You know, it's, 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 it's a glorious thing and an honorable thing, you know, to be a scholar for the most high. So, you know, know the truth. Get your precepts right. Don't let them come again, say, and try to tell you that you're not an Israelite and that and that your, your greatness never existed. Have that knowledge. So I hope this helped. And I, um, I hope this added um, to building up your spirit. And with that, I'm going to say shalom.